everybody. I think we have participants entering, so I'm just going to give everybody a minute to get in. But we'd like to welcome you all on this beautiful, beautiful Wednesday evening, or at least it's beautiful in Ottawa. I don't know where the rest of you are, but if you're in Ottawa, certainly it's nice and warm and beautiful. So it's uh, 5.32, so I think we're going to get started. So good evening, everyone. Anamikaje, bonjour à tous. Thank you for joining us for our fifth webinar of our Planetary Health webinar series in Community of Practice. Mon nom est Christina Lapelle et je suis la coordinatrice responsable gestion des programmes d'études du Bureau de l'internationalisation et de la santé mondiale. My role today is to provide the housekeeping remarks. And if you encounter any technical issues, our advice is to close all other applications on your computer, exit the webinar, and rejoin the session. And I, uh, I think we need to advance to the next slide. Okay, so uh, I would like to begin today's session with our Indigenous land acknowledgement. So we re pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all Indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. Nous reconnaissons les gardiens des savoirs traditionnels jeunes et âgés. Nous honorons aussi leur courage dirigeantière d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Uh, Dr. Eugenie Waters and Dr. Cl uh, Claudel Petrin de Rossier's presentation will be followed by a small group discussions and breakout rooms, after which we will provide a short opportunity to summarize each group's responses. And at that time, there will also be a brief period to answer any of your questions. Uh, you can type your questions in the chat or use the raise your hand feature. And uh, ce webinaire sera présenté en anglais, but participants auront aussi la possibilité de poser des questions en français. So it is now time to introduce Dr. Hussein Malou, our Director of Planetary Health at the Faculty of Medicine, and I will leave it to him to provide a brief overview of our Planetary Health webinar series and community of practice and introduce our speakers for today's workshop. Dr. Malou will also act as today's moderator for the Q&A session. So over to you, Hussein. Great. Thank you, Christina. And thank you to Christina and Marcia for continuing to keep us organized and uh, keep this webinar series going. Um, First, actually, I should say to all the women out there, um, happy International Women's Day. Um, thank you for all that you do. And certainly, I think it is, it, it's really cool that we're on International Women's Day, we're having a webinar that is being presented by two amazing women. So I think uh, things just align this way. I wish I could tell you we were smart enough to plan all this, but uh, um, I'm super excited about um, the fifth in our webinar series. Um, Claudel was asking how things were going, and I told her things were awesome. I think uh, things have been really good so far. Um, if you've missed any, please go to the Planetary Health website. And uh, if we could go to the next slide, that would be awesome. Um, here's the, uh, the objectives today. Uh, I'm sure they will be covered exceptionally well. And if we could go to the next slide, please. So I'm, I, I just want to introduce uh, Eugenie and Claudel. Um, so Dr. Eugenie Waters, I mean, you can read some stuff on there. She's a family doc. She does a ton of stuff. I just want to say, I mean, she has been a force in Ottawa and elsewhere for moving the planetary health agenda ahead. Um, from, I don't know, when I show up to do immunizations during COVID to tell everyone not to use plastic gloves, to going to City Hall and being heard on CBC, to um, you know, doing educational stuff for the medical students, to writing papers about not using paper on the on examination tables. I mean, she's everywhere. Um, really, an amazing advocate and a perfect person to be uh, doing this talk tonight. And she's joined by uh, Dr. Claudel Petrand Rosier, um, who had, like she's super young, but somehow has still managed to do a lot more than me, even though I'm like like 30 years older than her. And so she has a master's in environment and sustainable development. But what's what's really cool is she started this Quebec Association of Physicians for the Environment, which has done a ton of stuff. She's been a TEDx speaker, as you can see, you know, listed as 100 most influential women in Canada. 
I think one of the cooler things, though, that's not mentioned here is she's in this book that's made for teens that has 100 women change makers. And like in that book are people like Taylor Swift, but Clodell is in there as well. So anyway, I will hand it over to the two of them. I'm really excited about this evening. Um, it's something, this is a topic that we all like, I really want to know about more. So I will hand it over to you, Janine and Claudel. Thank you uh, for being here and especially on International Women's Day. Excellent. Well, thank you for that uh, great introduction. Thank you for um, having us today. And um, I will get started. Um, so I'm really uh, happy to be able to uh, present together with Dr. Petrain de Rosier today. And um, first of all, uh, what we're going to do today is define the CanMed's health advocacy role and talk a little bit about how it relates to planetary health. Uh, look at some approaches and examples of successful uh, physician-led planetary health advocacy in particular, and uh, look at some opportunities, uh, you know, through breakout groups that we're going to discuss together, share ideas about how we can do some planetary health advocacy ourselves within our different uh, spheres of influence. And I just want uh, to let you know that our slides we're seeing um, that covering on your slide. Oh, what are you seeing? Are you seeing, is that better? What's going on? Hmm. Okay, now it's better. Wait, now it's we, good. We, yeah. yeah. Huh, okay, one second. Um, I think I'm not in, one sec. Okay. You still seeing that? Um, you have to close, minimize the, the... There we go, okay. Ah, uh, there we go. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So that's that. So I just wanted to share, uh, first of all, uh, Hussein already mentioned that it's International Women's Day. And uh, in order to highlight that, I just wanted to talk about the fact that there are, we're living in a wonderful time. There are so many women who are leading on climate, on planetary health. And uh, I just thought I'd share a few um, books. There are so many authors right now, um, and it's really inspiring. So uh, Wangari Matai on the right side, you may have um, heard of her. She founded the Green Belt Movement in uh, Kenya, which spread throughout Africa in terms of reforestation and pairing um, tree planting together with uh, lots of efforts to, uh, very successful efforts to increase uh, women's rights. And she won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, for that. So it's, uh, great story uh, about uh, women leading climate. And then um, for, you know, Greta Thunberg's book is out here. And um, for busy physicians, All We Can Save is an amazing collection of uh, women leading on climate uh, in all sorts of spheres of society. And um, it's really great if you're busy, don't have a lot of time little short uh, essays, short stories, um, really easy to digest, pick up and put down. And, um, you know, we spoke about Indigenous um, knowledge and uh, wisdom, you know, in one of the first sessions of this series. And so Braiding Sweetgrass is kind of a foundational um, book for that. And each chapter is, uh, they all connect together, but each chapter stands alone. So it's another great one that's actually best read slowly so you have time to digest it. And uh, the last one I just wanted to highlight is uh, Catherine Hayhoe's book uh, called Saving Us. And Catherine Hayhoe, as you may know, is um, a Canadian uh, climate scientist, but who has been living and teaching in the US in Texas for many years and uh, her thesis her main thrust of all of her work is that you know the most important thing we can all do about climate change is uh, talk about it and uh, bring it down to the individual and how uh, it impacts all of us and so I think for us as healthcare professionals and physicians um, that message really um, uh, you know really resonates with us that you know it's we have an important role to play. Uh, so everyone's familiar with the CanMed's role. Um, I think uh, we know, you know, that uh, you know, health advocate is within our our roles and responsibilities as the medical expert, and uh, and planetary health advocacy really fits within that quite nicely. 
And you know, these are a few slides from the uh, Royal College. Um, uh, you know, health advocacy role. You know, I think it's great. Health advocacy can happen all the time. It's a team sport. And we're really looking at things like um, disease prevention, health promotion um, at the population level and talking about equity. All of this can relate to planetary health. And uh, I think, um, you know, their definitions, you know, talk a lot about, um, you know, really looking at how our planetary health work um, affects uh, the patients that we uh, are looking after, our communities, etc. And um, most importantly, you know, how can we as physicians in this health advocate role, how can we support the mobilization of efforts to uh, affect change? Um, and so, you know, I think um, we're probably all really good health advocates at the, you know, when we're looking at the patient in front of us, um, you know, our, our clinical practices, uh, perhaps, uh, you know, in, um, you know, within our institutions. And, uh, but I think it's important that we need to highlight that, you know, our responsibility as physicians and as leaders in society is that, you know, we need to look beyond our, our clinical environment and look broader. So we need to be, you know, looking at issues that affect health at a community or population scale and, um, and thinking about how we can affect positive change in that regard. And I love this advocacy is not an, um, an action for just an individual physician. It's a team sport. It's something that we're going to do uh, through collaboration together. And um, uh, I think that's, you know, really important. This is an image that some of you may have seen before. Um, it's uh, from uh, Dr. Courtney Howard. And she describes this as sort of like a nest and that when we look at healthcare, only about 20% of overall health outcomes or health status, you know, is responsible for the direct patient care that say I provide as a family doctor in the community here in Ottawa, or you provide as, you know, as an internist or, uh, you know, a surgeon or whatever your sphere when you're providing clinical care, you know, 20% of the outcomes of our patients are from our, our efforts. And so of course we're important, but even more important in terms of our patients' health outcomes overall is things that are social determinants of health and structural determinants. So this is where things, um, you know, like um, poverty, housing, mobility, um, racism, um, you know, other all sorts of other uh, inequities, all of these things uh, come into play. And then the next level is, you know, ecological determinants of health. And if we don't have a stable, well-functioning, healthy ecosystem, then, um, you know, that's going to impact our health. And our healthcare systems uh, in developed countries like Canada are very complex, and they function with the assumption that we have stable societal systems and that we have a stable uh, climate and right now you know we're seeing more and more that we don't have as stable uh, of a climate and uh, so as we see increasing uh, occurrences of natural you know uh, you know increasing um, you know wildfires and flooding and uh, you know changes in our um, you know uh, more unexpected uh, weather events, uh, it starts to affect uh, our ability to provide healthcare. And so, you know, over the pandemic, we've seen issues with uh, supply chain vulnerabilities. Um, you know, when we had the terrible wildfires in um, BC, for example, there were hospitals that had to be evacuated, uh, you know, uh, situations where, you know, people uh, need to evacuate from their homes. So all of these things show us that, you know, we can't provide high level healthcare if, um, you know, people don't have adequate housing and if we're in a state of emergency. So we really need to start looking at, you know, what can we do to stabilize uh, the climate and um, mitigate, you know, as much as we can, uh, increasing um, global warming and, and adapt and get ready um, where we where we can't necessarily mitigate. And so I just wanted to go over planetary health. I think you're all familiar with the concept after this series, but you know, just remembering that you know our role as a physician, we often look at just the patient in front of us, or you know, uh, public health. We're looking at the the health of um, uh, 
you know, a local population. So, you know, Ottawa Public Health looks after the population of health here in Ottawa. And uh, at the global health global health kind of framework or looking at way of looking at things is looking at how different populations um, affect one another. One Health is a, a concept looking further um, at not just human populations in isolation, but how they interact with, um, you know, uh, animals and uh, plants and ecosystems. And then Planetary Health is the most recent kind of framework for how to look at things and really you know the definition here is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural uh, systems on which it depends and it incorporates more um, of an in, you know an indigenous way of looking at the world uh, where we're not separate you know I'm not separate from my environment we're actually interconnected and mutually uh, dependent and uh, so that's that and we all know that climate change is the public health crisis and uh, not just climate change, but also uh, pollution, um, biodiversity loss, uh, deforestation, et cetera. And uh, so from an advocacy point of view, um, I think it's important to, to acknowledge that us as physicians, because you know, we may not be experts on climate change or environmental issues necessarily, but because we understand health, uh, we, we have a special role to play. And so me as a family doctor, I see patients with asthma, I see patients with, uh, you know, who've, um, you know, had forced migration, you know, I, I have, a, who've uh, immigrated here from Syria, for example, or um, who are facing, um, you know, uh, heat related illness, all of these things. And so I think it's important for us to not be intimidated, you know, because we're not climate scientists or, you know, think that we're not the expert, um, you know, we should take the lane and say, you know, I'm a health expert, so I, ha I have something to say about this and, and this is important. And I really like this uh, image, which comes from a publication in The Lancet, uh, again by uh, Dr. Howard, and it just highlights how, um, you know, how can we make change happen? How can we, as advocates, how can we how can we move the needle? And I think, you know, just like the CanMed's roles highlight in terms of advocacy, um, we don't have to do it alone. And it, we're not doing this in a vacuum. And, you know, it's really best when we're collaborating together with uh, colleagues or, um, you know, other like-minded people. And so we start here at the bottom, um, you know, finding people who share the same concerns, who share the same interests. And we think about a target. What is something that we want to improve in terms of you know, planetary health, whether it be something to make the delivery of healthcare more sustainable, perhaps it's um, taking on an issue in our community, um, perhaps, uh, you know, it's relating to an air quality pro uh, problem at the local level or at a national level or international. So we look at our target and we start to strategize together what are our skills, how can we um, make a difference in this, come up with tactics. And then when we get a win, you know, that fuels us and gives us more um, you know energy to to keep going um, but the most important thing in the middle here is storytelling and uh, there's an expression that uh, says uh, numbers numb but stories sell and so when we're trying to affect change um, you know we've seen this with climate scientists that like They've been showing graphs and data and uh, you know for years but it's not until we've started to see um, impacts on human beings and communities and, and stories um, that people start to see it as something that could affect them, uh, that's important to them. And so storytelling or um, you know, describing our efforts is really important. So we'll be doing that a little bit later. And um, because I've been quite involved in advocacy at a whole bunch of different levels and in different areas. Um, I'm always watching people who are, who I think are really good advocates and who've been quite successful and sort of seeing what are they doing? How can I emulate them? And I remember early in uh, the 
COVID pandemic, uh, Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment put out a series of webinars, and there was one specifically on advocacy and campaigning, and uh, Dr. Joe Vipond uh, put together his uh, presentation, and, and he had these seven lessons. So he said, you know, select the right target, make many partners, connect with anyone, talk with lots of people, and, you know, perfect your messaging, listen to your critics. Uh, you know, he talked a lot about using the media, owning the social media and starting again. And so I thought that was kind of an interesting approach. Um, and then, you know, as I said, I've been involved in lots of things. I've done some things on my own um, and together with others, you know, I've been, I've made efforts within organizations. So, you know, for example, within the Ottawa hospital or um, uh, within my community association. And then I've also um, advocated you know, from the outside where you're, you know, um, like I organized writing a letter to mayor, the, the previous mayor of the city of Ottawa about, you know, feeling like their um, action and investment on climate change uh, was not significant. And, uh, you know, I think as I think about my actions and areas of advocacy, I'm always kind of thinking about the different spheres. So, um, you know, where is the best place to put my energy? Um, what's the best target? And, uh, you know, so I think sometimes we think of these as binary things. Um, you know, am I motivated um, by anger at injustice or by uh, love for nature or my community or wanting to protect people. And so I think, you know, on the one hand, we can see that you can be an advocate from all these different angles, um, but it's actually not a binary thing. And um, I, uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention um, before I hand it over to Dr. Uh, uh, Petrain de Rosier is um, just the, it always encourages me to hear about the 3.5% rule. I'm not sure if you've heard about that, but in terms of movement making is that uh, we don't have to convince, you know, 50% or more of people to really start seeing change happening. But once we get more than 3.5% of the population really engaged and active on an issue, whether it be planetary health, you know, taking action on climate change or what have you, uh, then then you really start to see things snowball. So that always encourages me. So I'm going to switch over and let Claudel share some stories and experiences now. Uh, thanks. Um, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to, to join you. Um, as mentioned, I, I'm a family doc. I work in Ashlagam uh, is on in Montreal. I'm a native French speaker, so feel free to um, Ask question in French if, if you uh, if you feel like it. Um, I was asked to deliver a bit of I'll, I'll cover the objectives two and three. I'll try to of the presentation uh, of today. Um, I just want to start off. I, I've been involved with environmental advocacy for more than a decade now. I started as a medical student. I've been in practice for over a year and a half. Um, but advocacy is is it? It's a concept that I like and. Sometimes I hate it a little bit, but it's um, it's always been there. Um, it's something that I've always done in different types of ways, and I've learned along the way to like a bit prof professionalize the way I've 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 done it. And um, I have to say that in the last couple of years, it's grown exponentially, in, like in in a way that I did not anticipate. But I think it's it's also because of people who have been pioneer in the environmental and health movement that have helped us um, create the stage that we are currently standing on. Um, so I just, as a first example, and I'll, I'll try to give some positive examples of, 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 of types of advocacy that I've, that I've worked, but most of the time it doesn't really work. And I'm just, I'm not saying that to, to, to discourage you, but just as a, as a, as a way that we, we don't always have to expect like a super high level outcomes because sometimes that can be a bit discouraging, but we need to see little wins in, in, where, in, in where they are. Um, so I'm gonna start with a big win and I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring it on to a more realistic level. Um, so so the, first, the first story I wanna tell is, is, is one that goes back to 2014. So almost 10 years ago. Um, I was a I was a second year medical student, and I was involved in a federation that was called the International Federation of Medical Students Association, IFMSA, 
It's a network of over 1.3 million medical students that was created in 1951. Um, it it, it represents 1.3 million people in over 120 countries, and it's quite impressive. Um, what the Federation does really best, um, it's training health advocates and, 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 and to bring them on like highest level possible. So um, I took a year off med school to do that full time. Um, and I was I was sitting as the, the vice president of the Federation for, for a year. Um, and my responsibility was to do the, the advocacy work on climate change, on sustainable development and, and, and on global health. Um, 2014, 2015 was a big year. Um, if we, we talk about UN wise, um, it was the end of the sustainable uh, of the Millennium Development Goals. Um, we were drafting the sustainable development goals, but it was also the years leading to the Paris Agreement that was finally adopted in, in, in December 2015 in Paris. Um, so I'm bringing you to December um, 2014. Um, I was um, I was sent to the COP20, so the 20 conferences of party. Um, we there's the biodiversity COP that we just had in Montreal, but there's also the climate COP that happened every year around November, December. Um, in 2014, it was in in, in Lima, in Peru, um, and. The goal of that meeting was to get to a draft of what the Paris Agreement could look like a year later. Um, obviously, in the UN space, everything in, is negotiated down to the coma. Um, but but so it, it was it was a an important meeting. It's often overlooked because Paris was was the big show, but really the work happened in, in COP20 in Lima. So we were there, we were about four medical students and about 12,000 people. Um, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, and um, we, we, we took over the meeting. The reason was we, we got a draft of, of what the Paris Agreement would look like was 30 pages and health was not mentioned. Um, and in 2014, at that time, um, climate change was already recognized as the biggest threat, biggest threat to health of the 21st century by both the Lancet and, and the WHO. Um, we already had um, report by the, the IPCC on the on 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 the devastating impacts of climate change on our health, um, but health was not mentioned in in the draft of the Paris Agreement, and we we thought that this needed to be changed. Um, so. We took every every opportunity we would get. Again, we were four, well, three and a half medical students for two weeks conference with like 12,000 um, adults, people, <laughs> government representative and people that had, you know, other interests than in putting health in the draft. Um, and a year, like a, de a decade ago, um, climate change was not seen as a health issue. Um, so not only we had to make sure that people would see climate change as a health issue and the need to add um, health to the Paris Agreement, um, but we would have like a double case to make. Um, and so this happened in the like high level space, but we actually achieved what we wanted to do. But um, the backstory of that is that we we took over everything we, we could. So um, we created a draft in over three languages in French, Spanish and English. We we we, uh, we distributed them to policymakers. Um, we took the high stage to speak about um, about our goal and what we wanted countries to do. And basically we said, we, we've analyzed the text for you. This is where you can add this component to the text. You can see an article 30 and article 31B and so on. So we, we made it very, very easy for them to do. Um, and we, we didn't stop for a full week. Um, we had a chance to speak on behalf of the youth group on the opening ceremony. Um, and um, I, 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 I was the one appointed to, to lead that speech. It was a collective effort. But basically, I told them that I, you know, I told them that if they, they, they felt their, their mission to adopt a, like early, an ambitious enough draft, um, they would make my job very difficult as a doctor because of, because of climate change. Um, and a couple of days later, my, my colleague Mark, who's like six foot, six feet tall from Australia, get approached by someone he was like hey are you the doctor that you know spoke on the opening ceremony and the, the guy with mark was like how, how how i'd never spoken public and we realized that the that the people didn't you know really care about who was giving the the, the message who was giving the the intervention but they remembered that there was doctors in the room um and that you know that struck me for a while because i was like this 
our voice is powerful because of, of our identity as, as professional and because we're trusted voices and in and, 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 and this space, doctors and medical professionals are still a rare thing. Um, and we, we were seen as special, but also um, as, as relevant. Um, next slide, please. So, so we actually get um, get to what we, where we wanted, and if you look at the Paris Agreement as, as today, um, and Article 108, um, you have the word um, health co-benefits. Um, there's only two mention of health in the whole agreement, and 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 it's it's because of the work that medical students have done a decade ago. And obviously, we're supported by the WHO and a few other health organizations, but mostly it was it was work done on the ground. Um, and it's still, you know, it still amazed me that we we had that kind of impact. But um, I think it's it's the biggest example that I have of of advocacy that tank, that can work in an environment that seems to be hostile to start with. Uh, but the reason it worked is because a we never stop. <laughs> B, I think our messages was good. Um, we used every tool that we had out there. We used blog, we used interviews. We, we, you know, every day we would we would work for a while um, to make sure that we were seen and heard. Um, and and five actually five countries submitted our our proposition, um, and it stayed until today. So the Paris, it's still on on Article One Hundred Eight. But for me, it's. Um, it was a humbling lesson that that things can work, and it still gave me hope that when we do things right, we get we get what we want. Um, next one, please. Um, another example that I wanted to give in more recent, and is on, it is on national level. Um, but um, I don't know if you know, but every year the Lancet um, publish a, a report on climate change and health is seen as one of the most influential pieces of literature on the climate change impacts. Um, on, on our health and healthcare systems. Um, and for the last five, six years, um, there's teams around the world that develop policy brief for countries. So basically we use the Lancet data and we produce recommendation that would apply on a national or sub-national level so that you know, um, we, can, we can see some changes on, 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 the, on national grounds. And I've been involved in this work for the last uh, four years. Um, it's 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 a very interesting work because it's hard that we get, it's it's not often that we get to play with with data and not only you know put out there our analysis, but that we we actually transform um, scientific numbers into what they mean in in real life in terms of what we should do next in terms of politics. Um, and in 2021, so a year about two years ago, a year and a half ago. Um, our main recommendation is that we, we needed to get a conversation going on adaptation in this country. So we often talk about climate change from like an emission point of view that we need to reduce our emissions, especially from transport. But there's so much more to climate change. And one thing we often overlooked was the need for adaptation. So, you know, even if we tomorrow, if tomorrow we, we stop emitting gas um, and GHG will still, you know, be living up with the consequences of climate change for the next 50 years, mostly, uh, before we, we see the impacts of reaction of today. Um, and the way that we, we, we can reduce these impacts on our system, on our community, on our health is, is, is through adaptation. But we didn't have any strategy. Um, adaptation received less than like 3% of federal funding on, on climate change. Um, and we put up in a brief that, you know, we, we need to get a conversation going on adaptation. And this could, you know, take the form of a national adaptation strategy. And it turns out that a couple of months later, um, the government, um, the, the federal government actually um, started five working groups on adaptation. Um, and a couple of uh, months ago, uh, the first Canadian national adaptation strategy was published. It's not perfect. Um, there's still room for improvement, especially from a finances perspective. Um, the funding is not what we anticipated. It's less than what we, we, we asked originally. But I think it's a good example that when healthcare professionals um, do their job of being the health experts that, that we are, um, we, we, we can get um, people moving, especially like such on, on a federal level. Um, so now that the time is, is to work on implementation on the implementation of that strategy, but still, um, I think we can we can see that as a as a success. Um, next one, please. I'm going to use the um, the two lessons that Joe Vipon share on the advocacy uh, perspective, and I think the reason that we had so much success um, 
and again, success is related. I mean, we are not in Quebec. We're not the. We we often are seen as the the, the one who are a step ahead in terms of environmental action, but we're still governed by a government that's still pretty conservative when it comes to the environment. Um, but I think where we did succeed in 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 making ourselves out there and be, being a reference in terms of environmental health is because we've. We've used and owned the media pretty well, um, and this is the tip number six and seven um, that Joe that Joe shared. Um, but there's two reasons that we did that, and one of them is is because um, you know not only well health professionals are, are trusted voices, so that's something that you you probably experiment on a daily basis. People want to hear what we have to say. Um, it can be on the individual level when we see a patient in our clinic, but collectively as a profession when we say no to something often will get the interest of journalists and, and government representatives. So we, we need to be reminded that as in the climate or environmental spheres, we are still trusted voices. Um, it's still new that doctors um, get their voices or their statements on, on environmental issues, but I think it, it opens up a really good space for discussions. Um, and there's another reason, and that one has been proven by, by some studies, and I'll show you one of them, but is that people respond well to a health frame. And it's been, it's been show, um, if you can move to the next slide. Um, so you have a study that was published very recently um, in, in 2022 um, by a group affiliated with the Lancet, um, but they've evaluated diff different types of frames when it comes to climate change. So if we speak um, about climate change from an economic perspective or um, a migration perspective or an environmental perspective, and what they found out is that when we speak about climate change from a health perspective, um, this is where we can um, get people um, become more supportive of ambitious politics, uh, policies, sorry. Uh, and is that, that works, especially for people who, are, who stated that they are not concerned by climate change. So this is interesting because no other frames does that. Um, so what we realize is that even when people are saying, mm, I'm not concerned by, by climate change, if we present them with, with will help arguments, especially a positive framing, so a health co-benefits type of framing, um, then people seem to be more keen to support ambitious policies when it comes to climate change, both in the terms of adaptation and mitigation perspective. Um, so, so, so I'm I'm often asked like I I, I don't I, I do quite a lot of media, and the reason I do that is not because I want to get attention to myself. It's because of those type of numbers. Is that we we know that we we can change. Um, we, we can change the way people see climate actions. Um, and I think it's it's where we we, we do fit, um, where we can use our voice. Um, next one, please. I'm, I'm gonna go over quickly the next one, just because I wanna leave time for us to, to discuss and have some more small groups. But um, I'm just giving an example of, of a mediatic stunt that we've done about two years ago, that three years ago now, um, that was right before COVID. Um, but we, we actually call it a climate health emergency in the province of Quebec. And we've organized a quick, like a short media conferences. Um, and we had over 200 media mentioned in that day. We were everywhere. We were in the biggest news. We were in like the, 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 the TV and the metro in the subway stations in Montreal. Um, and I think it was like what really set up the scene, the, the stage and made us seem like unavailable, like unavoidable when it comes to, to discussing climate change in, in Quebec. And today we I get phone calls almost every day by media saying, hey, we want to hear what you think. Um, we want to we we want to we want to convey your 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 um, your concerns and and your 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 point of view because we we find it's an added piece to to what we already do. Um, you can slip skip a couple of slides. Um, Eugenie goes to um, yeah. You can skip that. It's an example of things we've done. Um, next one. Yeah. Um, so my final sort of um, tips or advice, and I think this is really what. You know, when I when I reflect on the way on 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 the on what we've done in the last three to four years is that we've we've made a space for ourselves, um, not only in the media sphere in Quebec, uh, but but actually quite interestingly, um, I was told that you know a couple of years ago by my medical schools that you know I shouldn't do too much climate advocacy that my my job as a medical student was to get um, to study medicine. Um, and 
when I, I started getting traction on by like traditional media and social media about the work and, and, and the work that I was doing from a advocacy perspective, I got recruited by my university to lead some work internally on, on planetary health education. Um, so it's good to have that kind of balance. So now I'm doing kind of academic work on this, but also keeping on building the, the media work just because it's 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 one of the I find the most efficient way to get um, a discussion and, and to actually speak to a wide range of people. Um, and in French, I like the saying that on est devenu des incontournables. Um, I didn't find a proper translation for that in English, but I think I can translate it from like become unavoidable, like unavoidable, like always be there. Um, and the moment you're always there, people start seeing you as a reference and like they want to have, uh, they want to hear what you have to say, they want to hear your opinion. And I think this is where you can uh, switch minds, perspective, um, and get some wins. Um, and, and, when I talk about some small wins and we have to define what, what wins are, but we've got some documentaries going on climate change and health. We got invited to um, governmental um, official commissions on sustainable development health and health, which we were not a couple of years ago. So for me, it's, 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 a, it's signals that, that things are moving. Um, so I'll stop there um, and we'll have like maybe 10, a bit more than 10 minutes for, for discussions, questions, and then we'll go back and, uh, in, 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 in the bigger group. Um, Eugenie, you can retake the lead from here. Uh, we can maybe pose the questions in the chat as well. Questions are in the chat. I think we just need to decide if we want two breakout rooms or if you want three, whatever works best for you. I think, um, I think three breakout rooms would be great. Yeah. Okay. So we'll probably have a very compressed and dynamic uh, discussion for Maybe a little bit less than our planned, uh, maybe 12 minutes. Is that okay? <laughs> so we have time to get back quickly or? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you'll get an invitation to your group and go ahead and start talking and you'll see the discussion questions in the, uh, in your chat box. Great. And sorry, I hope everyone got a little word in edgewise with your group. Um, Maybe um, if it's okay, Christina, maybe we'll ask for like a one minute uh, sharing from each group. Would, uh, let me see, I'm just gonna pick people I see and see if they were in a group. Uh, oh yeah, good idea. We can also share in the chat. That's a great idea. Uh, Nyef, uh, do you wanna share from your group perhaps? Sure. Um, I mean, I guess we we introduced ourselves and talked about what we were passionate about. And what I really enjoyed is that we all have different kind of areas of planetary health that we're um, kind of tackling, showing how diverse it is and um, going from reproductive rights uh, and, and women's rights to sustainable health care to then going through um, uh, like smoking cessation and and how that applies to kind of the same concepts in planetary health and advocacy. So, yeah, it was pretty good. Great, thank you. Um, I think there were three groups, so I'm not sure uh, if someone who was not in Yev's group and not in my group wants to share. Anyone wanna jump forward? I'm gonna say that I dared to say that I was not an advocate and I got a good pep talk from Chardin. And so, uh, so I'm gonna think that through next time. <laughs> <laughs> we're, whether we think it or not, we're all doing the work, right? That's great. Um, James, did you want to say a quick synopsis of our group, perhaps? Or, or maybe uh, Shirley? Yeah, I think we can. It would be nice to have had longer. And I think we're coming from different areas. I'm afraid my French was limited to under, maybe you could summarize. Um, is it now Papillon? Because I, I, it sounded very interesting, but I couldn't quite capture everything that she was saying um, and other initiatives that people had. And also that um, there's going to be the Faculty of Medicine is trying to set up some kind of network with the hospitals as well. That sounds really good to have contact people. Um, so that sounds really interesting. Yeah, one of the things that, um... Uh, was mentioned in our group is that how things have changed in terms of um, planetary health 
uh, one of the members of our group was previously advocating in environmental issues and, and kept their identity as a physician kind of hidden because at that time it didn't feel like it was an advantage to be or it was kind of risky for their career and so things have uh, they were encouraged to hear uh, some of the examples and that the the climate has changed not the the climate in terms of not the climate but uh, you know in terms of the role of health professionals uh, speaking out uh, in terms of environmental issues so maybe if you have anything else add it to the chat and I will hand things back over to uh, Dr. Malou. Well, um, first, I just I just want to say thank you so much uh, to you know you Eugenie and Claudel. Like it was it was really inspiring to hear this talk, and uh, I, I kind of wish I'd been there for Claudel's pep talk to Matilda. So I'll have to hear what that was because uh, kind of feel like Matilda does. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, this was this was awesome, and and lots of ideas. I, I wish we had more time because I'd love to kind of get into how you actually get started in this space, or if you don't like social media, like, what do you do? Um, you know, if you're not on Instagram, you know, then like, how do you, you know, things like that. And, and so, um, but, but it was a, it was a great session. And I guess if we have questions like that, or if people have questions like that, can we reach out to you and Clodell? I mean, I know Clodell gets lots of media requests. We'll so probably get lost in her email, but, uh, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to, to get advice from, uh, from both of you. So um, we have one session left. I know it's 629, so I'm gonna plug our last session. It's gonna be awesome as well. Uh, we have uh, Andrea McNeil, um, who's a real, again, another icon in planetary health um, in, in Canada and internationally. Uh, she'll be kind of looking at future direction of planetary health. She's actually, I think co-editing the next like Lancet um, kind of planetary health uh, countdown. So um, so really cool. I think she'll have really interesting stuff to say, and I hope um, I hope to see a lot of you back for that last session. And thank you again to our presenters. And again, um, happy International Women's Day. Uh, this is a this is a great way uh, to to celebrate. I think so. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. We'll be sending you the link to the video very shortly. Cool. Thanks.